So, if I could introduce myself, Christine Kilpatrick's my name. I'm the CEO of Melbourne Health, Royal Melbourne Hospital, and I'd just like to uh, introduce uh, two very important people. Firstly, uh, Dr. Mike Catton, who is head of the Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory, which we call Vidural, um, and Mike is also uh, the deputy director of the Doherty Institute, which is a partnership between the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital. And I also have beside me uh, Julian Drews, who is the head of the Virus Identification Laboratory, uh, and uh, he's been uh, intimately involved in uh, this very important piece of work. So I'll hand over to Mike and uh, Julian. Thank you Thank very you. much, Christine. So look, could I add my welcome um, to all of you today here to the Doherty Institute? I'd just like to start by saying how pleased we are um, to have been able to grow this virus in a very short space of time um, directly from a patient's sample, and that's an art. And I guess Julian is the artist, who you'll possibly hear about um, on the technical detail. But much more importantly, um, that we've moved immediately to share this with our um, international colleagues to provide a toolkit um, that complements the modern molecular techniques that are so useful in diagnosis and development of vaccines and medicines. So there are some things that are just much easier to do when you have um, the virus in your hands and there are exp expert laboratories internationally that haven't had access to the virus. And so this step uh, makes it possible for a lot of things to move forward that have been delayed. And we're just delighted um, to have been able to fill that gap um, in the space between 2 a.m. Saturday morning when the first case was diagnosed in Australia and Monday when we believe we had the virus growing in culture. So Julian and I will be very happy to take questions um, from you on anything you'd like to know. Thanks a lot. So what's it been involved in growing a virus and what is the process if you can step us through that? Yeah, so look, it's an old school technique. The current diagnostics are very rapid and fast using molecular methods, but the old school techniques you have or rely on cell lines or cell sheets that grow in a single layer of cells on a flask and you inoculate or place some patient material onto those cells and you hope that the virus in the sample gets into the cells and infects the cells and then will produce a, uh, a pattern in the cells that demonstrates that the cells are dying and that's what we see and I think the uh, image of that's been put up on the web and uh, so you can see that the cells actually die in the progression of infection and so that's how we know the virus is happening and we've used the same test on that material that we use in patients to assess the level of virus to, so that we know that the burden of virus or the amount of virus present is going up and so we can prove that the virus is growing. Is it a difficult So look, it's, some viruses are very fussy in terms of the cells that they require to uh, gain entry into the cells. So all viruses need the appropriate receptor on the cells to gain entry. So it's a little bit like a lock and key. Um, and the virus has the, the key and the cell has the lock and if the, if the right things are present, the virus can get inside. We're, having the, we're hearing that it happened very quickly. Were you surprised at the rapid rate that it did occur? Uh, look, yes and no. Um, we've grown a number of these family of viruses in the past and you've probably heard of SARS and MERS coronavirus and they, they both grow relatively quickly in cell culture. So in, in some ways it didn't. Um, and, but the international interest is obviously fascinating and the fact that other people have not yet grown it. But there's only been limited spread outside of China at the moment, so not too many people have had that ability. And we're uniquely placed here that we've got both a diagnostic lab that's doing that work, plus these old traditional methods in the one laboratory that can bring those two together. Can you run through for us the possibilities that this now creates? What's the next step? So, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So. Um, in addition to the, in the molecular techniques that might be used in the development of vaccines and medicines, the, uh, the virus can be used in the assessment of the effectiveness of vaccines, particularly, and of medicines. It also gives us the opportunity to create a first-generation antibody test. Um, and that's important both in the clinical management of patients who may be late in the illness and past the point where they're shedding um, the virus that we detect with molecular techniques. And it's also really important for us to look at um, things like uh, asymptomatic infection with the virus, that possibility, or, um, sub or mild infection that hasn't come to 
um, the attention of health authorities and those patients haven't been tested and identified as cases. So really an antibody test is the only way to answer some of those important epidemiological questions which get you to questions of how many cases and how does the number of deaths relate to the number of cases um, that you're seeing on the ground. So um, a great many um, things are possible with the virus that add, complement and add to what you can do with the fast and powerful molecular techniques. So we'll start with the antibody test then, which obviously precedes mm -hmm. the vaccine. Um, at the moment it's being said that you don't know you've got coronavirus until you're showing symptoms, so you're saying that the antibody test will be able to prove if you do or don't before you start showing symptoms. I, sh I should clarify, those um, clinical diagnosis is done when you recognise that you have a patient and um, you really need a clinical illness to have that patient front medical care. What I was talking more about is what are called seroprevalence studies, where you look at a population and you look at the um, uh, rate of antibody positivity in that population so that you can find out what the um, wider number of patients that are infected is. So I think the mainstay of uh, clinical diagnostics and public health will remain the molecular te techniques because they're so fast and they're so powerful. The antibody techniques are a complement and help us understand the epidemiology of the outbreak in that sense. How much further along then does this take you towards getting a vaccine? Uh, well that's really outside my direct area of expertise. I'm not someone that develops vaccines for a living. I'm a public health person that de um, develops tests and is part of public health responses. But it's a, it's a key step in um, development of vaccines to uh, assess vaccines. Animal models are very helpful, so there are colleagues that are working in Australia to develop models to test um, candidate vaccines on. Having the virus is a crucial step to um, allow them to proceed. They thought they were going to have to wait um, for some time to import the virus from somewhere else. Now we are, are in the process of getting the virus to them. Um, when you say them, are you referring to the who? I'm referring to CSIROR, um, that's one of the groups. So that's, that's also here in Victoria, and that's a very expert um, lab that, are, that have worked in the past on animal models. There's also researchers and scientists in Queensland are trying to work with Quite true. Yep. vaccine. So are you working hand in glove with them, or is it perhaps just the same? I've actually seen an email in my email box that I haven't had time to read this morning because we've been so hard pressed. I have no doubt that conversation is about to take place, but I can't say that it has yet. And then with that process, Oh no, no. The, in, the intent is to get the actual virus. Well, there are, there are several parts. The very first thing we're doing, which we're doing today, is to get genetic material extracted from the virus in the hands of public health labs in the various state jurisdictions. So they've got a positive control for their laboratory tests. Because the testing we've been doing so far has been limited by the absence of a virus or often um, even a um, synthetic positive control. So that's the very first thing because that's directly about public health capacity in Australia. And then the next thing we do is to um, then ampule up, and this is Julian's territory more than mine, um, ampule up the virus itself um, for sharing with expert laboratories that are recommended to us by the World Health Organization as the first internationally with which the virus could be shared. So we'll, we'll work closely with WHO and take their advice on um, on who should receive the virus first. Uh, has culturing this in the dish been able to tell you anything about the virus? Have you learned anything new? I'll, I'll defer to Julian on whether he learned anything new looking down the microscope, but uh, it, no, I'll, I'll let you take no, the test. Really. Other, other, other than it may, may generate a lot of media attention, um, <laughs> but no, look, it hasn't. It, it, it's grown like other traditional coronaviruses in the past. And uh, so in that capacity, nothing new. I've been um, in contact with a colleague in Germany, uh, Christian Drosten, who is also uh, very familiar with coronaviruses and he pretty much discovered SARS. And he has given his advice on when to harvest the virus for uh, onward shipment to uh, important laboratories. And, and something that's a bit of the fun part to, to maybe mention is obviously the Although the testing can be done in standard laboratories, you shouldn't culture exotic viruses like this outside secure high containment laboratories, and they're hard work to get in and out of. So we've had on the flask of the cell culture a video camera 
um, that has been linked up to, uh, and Julian was able to share with me the link. So we're able to look from home at how the culture's going. So when I get up in the 3 a.m. in the morning for a glass of water, can log on and, and have a look at how the cells are going. So that, that was a bit of fun over the last few days. Um, if, you know, if you're into that sort of thing, and I guess perhaps we need to get out more, but uh, <laughs> we, we found that uh, quite fun. Uh, how satisfying was it when you realised Oh, when did we realise? No, oh, how satisfying. satisfying. Oh, I was, it was pretty satisfying because, <laughs> you know, look, from a, you know, it, it all feeds into the global health response and the pub yeah. for a public health initiative, and it's a really important component in that because no virus has appeared to come out of China yet, and it appears that other people have had difficulty growing. Yeah. So, so, look, we, we were very pleased. Um, and, uh, and you ac actually saw us live on camera with the final test um, in the footage. I haven't seen the, actually the media coverage so far, but we were actually on film looking at the, um, the nucleic acid test, really confirming finally that we had the culture. So I don't know, that was a rare show of emotion from me anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> have you sequenced this virus yet? That's uh, with our colleagues at the Doherty Centre for Genomics. That's when this is over, uh, we have a meeting to discuss to uh, advance that immediately. So that's the very next thing that we want to do is move from having the virus and sharing the virus to sequencing the Australian isolate. Um, and, that, and that's the full genome. Yes, we've already we got... Have, we have short sequences from the diagnostic test which generate products that can be sequenced and that helped us verify and validate the performance of the test. From the short sequences you have, does this look like an identical we, genome? It's an exact match to the sequence yeah. from China. Yeah. So, that, so, so is that probably good news? Because yeah, well, it, 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 it actually validates or tells you that your test method is spot on and you are de getting the virus and the specific virus doing the segments are too short really to, to shed light on the properties of the virus. We really need the whole sequence to look at that. Um, I'd be surprised if there are significant changes from the, the prototype virus that's on the web itself. Um, if there are any small changes, it's probably just interest in tracking the strain um, slight evolution rather than fundamental change in the properties of the virus. But that's speculation on my part. That's just what I expect. We hear that the central right here is um, I'll take that. Yeah, it, it was a patient in Australia. Was it one in Victoria or it was our first diagnosis. So there's, there's a running joke in public health that if something um, challenging is going to happen, it'll be the Friday night before a long weekend, and this didn't disappoint. Um, so we were, we were actually sitting down, um, Julian and Catherine Bond, who's in the audience and I, to plan staffing for the weekend and do a handover and what we were going to be doing, because I'd been in a teleconference all afternoon, and we'd sort of barely sat down, then scientists were hovering at the door with, um, we think we might have a provisional positive. So that too, that was, that was a bit of a, well, exciting's probably the wrong word, but, uh, but it did get our attention. So, so then things flowed through the evening and the night. Um, one of our staff came in from annual leave, who was particularly expert in the sequencing, sequenced till 2 a.m when we were confident enough to put out the results. He worked on till 4 a.m. on a, another sequence to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. Um, so it was a long night. I know you said you're not a vaccine expert, but the speed at which you were able to do this, which was a little over 48 hours, does that give any hope as to how quickly we may be able to develop the next step? Um, I guess when we provide the virus to others who will bring their expertise to it, that will mean that if you like the cycle time on what they can do will be short. If it was taking three or four weeks to grow, it would obviously take them a lot longer. So yes, in answer to your question, that is a good thing, I think. I think the general tone of discussion internationally about the virus up to now was that it was hard to grow and it was slow to grow when it grew. And in our hands at least, um, Julian's hands, green thumbs, that wasn't true, it's been quite quick. So I, I think that's a positive thing. Your research has, well, it's not just research, but what you've done in the lab has been described as a game changer. Um, do you see, I guess, the, the eventual um, containment of the coronavirus starting here? I, I think that's probably overselling what we've contributed a little bit. Um, I, um, this, is a, this is a step it's a piece of the puzzle that we've contributed. Um, 
it's it, it's very useful to the global effort. Um, I don't think we I don't think really that the global eradication of this virus starts here. I think that would be overselling what we've done, which, which is a good thing, and we're really proud and happy about it, but it's only one small piece of the puzzle. Julian, is there a reason, you mentioned that other labs have struggled to grow this, is there a reason why you were able to do this and they weren't? It's like I said earlier, I think it's just the unique position that we still maintain the old traditional styles of culture, which are very limited in resources in most labs now. Most labs do not have that capacity and to have the, a bank of cell lines accessible. Now, we've only, we only routinely have two cell lines that are um, being maintained at any one time, but we have many more in the, the freezer and we've evaluated those cells in the past to SARS, and so we're well placed for that kind of approach. So it just means that we're, we've got the two parts of that puzzle together in the one laboratory, which is, makes us uniquely placed for that ability. For the diagnostic component, to then use that same patient material in their virus isolation component. But to amplify on what Julian said, we, our business is being ready for these sort of things. Um, so the tools that Julian's lab has at their disposal, be it a um, broadly active coronavirus detection molecular test that he had that we knew would work, um, even in, in advance of the sequence being out internationally, because based off SARS and MERS, we predicted that there will be events like this and designed a test that would predict it. So that was one way in which we were ready. And a simple way in which we were ready is that there are a couple of flasks of fresh cells ready to go all the time. So you're not having to prepare anything. You can go straight from when you have a positive on the molecular test to, as Julian did, um, putting as much of the sample onto the fresh cells um, as you are able to do, even if it's at some ungodly hour of the day and a long weekend. Um, and m maybe it was that. Is what, there like, any correlation between how difficult it is to reproduce the cell lines with how easily, how easily the, um, the virus transmits? I wouldn't draw a straight line between those two things, no, because there are so many vagaries of how easily viruses grow in the lab in cell culture that are nothing to do with um, how they transmit between humans. So, so this doesn't inform you more on, on the no, transmission? No, no, I wouldn't, wouldn't say no. that. Could you tell us a little bit about the biosecurity arrangements? I imagine you must have very tight security. We do, but if, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, all I'll summarise in saying it is, is there is as much physical and um, procedural and electronic security in this building as we could build. Like, is it more than is usually here? Like, have you additionally locked down because of this virus? Because of the, how high the security was anyway? No, we haven't escalated that. Sure. I'm, I'm really, um, well, I guess the main um, thing to highlight there again is the antibody test and that it's quite technically demanding to try and make a test to um, test for antibodies if you don't have the agent itself. It's certainly hard to validate it um, in the absence of clinical samples. So I'd highlight the antibody test there. But it does quality assure um, the molecular testing that you're doing, having access to the real virus as well. It's really powerful um, computing available to us these days. There is software, like when I was a lad, um, at the sort of dawn of the era of molecular diagnostics and virology, it was all done longhand. Um, it was pretty slow. Nowadays, um, software will design for you a test, and you can be pretty sure out of the starting blocks that it'll work for you. Um, so. There's availability of, of a prototype test in silico, as we call it, in the computer that you can be pretty sure will work, but you never quite know until you've got the real clinical sample, until you've got the real virus. So, so an incremental improvement in the molecular testing is available with the virus, um, but it's mainly about um, the other tools, and notably an antibody test. And just to highlight as well, having the virus also allows quality control globally to be kind of enhanced and everyone's assay or test to be kind of um, have relativity to them. So we can assess what the performance basis of everyone's test is by having a proficiency panel or the same material sent to every lab in the world that does the testing to see their performance and everyone then gets a feel for how their test actually performs and we can 
from that select what is in fact the best or most sensitive test available. So that, that's also something we do here. We run a measles um, antibody testing proficiency program for more than 200 World Health Organization labs around the world out of this building. Julian's labs um, run in collaboration with the Australian College of Pathologists, a proficiency program for detection of um, mosquito-borne viruses again around the world to expert laboratories, so, and as well as collaborating with them to quality control amongst the expert public health labs um, in Australia that are our colleagues in the other state jurisdictions. So um, in that often we have an agent that because of the security around it, others can't, then we often are able to produce non-infectious material, derivatives from that, that can safely be manipulated in other laboratories and use them to um, ensure the consistency and quality of testing around Australia, either for the public health labs, if it's a specialised agent, or more widely, um, as required. Any further questions? All right, we'll okay. wrap it up there. Okay. Um, Thanks.